up next on Walking by Faith. When Satan wants to attack your life, his most common strategy is to bring someone into your life to bring compromise, to befriend you, and to take you away from God. Hello, I want to welcome you today to Walking by Faith, and I'm so glad that you've joined us. Now, we've been looking at, at Samson and getting our lessons from him. Now, the interesting thing about Samson is this, that we learn what not to do. Now, he was a man that was called of God, anointed of God, gifted of God, but yet he did not reach his potential. And he didn't fulfill his purpose because of the things that he did. Uh, he had a problem with his eyes. He had a problem with lust. And we'll find that what happened was this. He did not conquer it when it was young. And it literally controlled him and ultimately destroyed him when he was old. He was a man who was constantly alone. You could almost call him the Lone Ranger. But the difficulty that came in his life was he had no one to speak into his life. He had no one to rebuke him when he was wrong, when he would begin to go in the wrong direction. You know, God did not just call us to be alone in our relationship with Him. He called us to be in relationship with each other. And we need people in our lives who can speak into our lives and tell us when we're going in the wrong direction. I want you to come with me right now as we go into this session, as we're looking at Samson and taking biblical principles from his life and applying them in ours. Now, we began last week talking about how to choose a spouse and how to be a good choice. Samson was really bad at this, all right? Judges 14, it says, now Samson went down to Timnath. He saw a daughter, oh, excuse me, he saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. He goes home and he says to his parents, now therefore get her for me as a wife. And he literally, he goes and he marries a woman who does not believe in God, doesn't live for God, doesn't worship God, and of course it ends up an absolute mess. The New Testament tells you and I not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's amazing to me how many people would consider marrying someone who doesn't even believe the way that they believe, who has no intention of serving God the way that they want to serve God. Now, the Bible's very clear what will happen is your heart will be turned away from God. Solomon, well, here's what it says. It says, but King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, and the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love. And so it was when Solomon was old that his wives turned his hearts, his heart, excuse me, after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God. Now here's, here's Sol Solomon who had twice had God appear to him in dreams and speak to him in dreams. And yet ungodly spouses turned his heart away from God. Listen to what it says here about Ahab. It says, and he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab. For he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. Again, his wife turned his heart away from God. And I love what it says about Ahab. It says, and there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. You know, you want a spouse who's going to stir you up to serve God. Now, we're going to take and look some more at Samson. And I want to talk to you about being in the right place. Or I could say not being in the wrong place which is literally what Samson did. Now, the Bible tells us in Judges 13 that before Samson was born, an angel appeared to his mother 
and said, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink or eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor will come upon his head, for the child will be a Nazarite to God from the womb. Now, so this is what Samson's going to be. He's going to be a Nazarite, which simply meant a couple of things. He couldn't cut his hair. Hey, he couldn't touch anything unclean. He couldn't get around any dead bodies. And he had to totally separate himself from anything that had to do with the vine. No wine, no grapes, no raisins, no raisin cakes. I mean, anything that had to do with the vine, he had to stay away from it. So, Judges 14, 5, So Samson went down to Timnath with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnath. Now, I want to ask you a question. What is a guy who is a Nazarite? who cannot be around grapes, raisins, juice, anything like that, what is he doing in a vineyard? I mean, he is in the wrong place. And now look, it says, now to his surprise. Well, it is a surprise to him because he is spiritually dense. Right? To his surprise. A young lion came roaring against him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he tore the young lion as one would have torn apart a young goat. Though he had nothing in his hand, but he didn't tell his father and mother what he had done. Now, he is in the wrong spot. He's where he shouldn't be. And a lion comes out and attacks him, and I just love it. Like I said, it says, to his surprise. Listen to 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Let me tell you who he's going to attack. He's looking for you when you are in the wrong place. You get where you should not be, and you may be surprised when the devil shows up, but you shouldn't be, right? Because when you are where you should not be, the devil, like a roaring lion, is looking, seeking whom he may devour, right? You're watching things that you shouldn't watch. You're hanging around with people you shouldn't hang around with. You're in a casino. You're at a singles bar. You're at some wild party, and you're like, oh, look at the temptation. How did this show up? <laughs> well, duh. You're where you don't belong in that. The devil, like a roaring lion, seeks whom he may devour. 1 Corinthians 15, do not be deceived. Again, where the Bible says don't be deceived is where we are the most deceived. It's like God knew you are going to be deceived when it comes to this subject. So he says, now, now be careful here. Realize this is an area you're likely to miss it. It says, evil company corrupts good habits or good morals. Now, there's some people you just should not hang around. Proverbs 6, 23. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is life. The reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep you from. Now, it mentions here the evil woman. How many know there's some evil men too? Wave at me. All you girls, you've dated them, you know. And to keep you from. Now, now literally, I want you to listen. The Bible says that God's, God's word, it's talking specifically about the commandment, the law. It's talking about the word of God. And then it says the reproofs of instruction. The reproofs of instruction are a person who cares about you, who tells you you're going the wrong way. I mean, there's some people, they just come and they just trash you. You know, you're an idiot, you're a fool, you did this wrong, you know. They've got nothing but bad to say about you. But there's other people that will correct you because they love you and they want to help you. And they'll come and say, you know, this is what you did, but if you would have done it this way, it would have been better. Right? Those are called in the Bible the reproofs of instruction. It says they're the way of life. And notice, to keep you from the evil, let's just say it this way, the evil person. When Satan wants to attack your life, his most common strategy is to bring someone into your life 
to bring compromise, to befriend you, and to take you away from God. That is his number one strategy. All right? Notice it says to keep you from the evil woman. God's word is supposed to give you enough wisdom so that there, you see certain people and you recognize that person is not going to help me in my life. They're not going to help me in my relationship with God. The closer I get to them, the farther I'm going to get from God. All right? On the other hand, when God wants to bless you, one of the things that God often, often, often does is he brings somebody into your life who's going to give you the reproofs of instruction. He brings somebody into your life that's going to encourage you and help you live a godly life and pursue God. Right? So God's word is to give you the wisdom to recognize that there are certain people you should not have in your life. Right? And at the same time, give you the wisdom to recognize the people that should be in your life. Proverbs 13, he who walks with wise men will be wise. The companion of fools will be destroyed. One paraphrase says it this way, their life will begin to unravel. Their life will begin to unravel. Jimmy Evans, my favorite Jimmy Evans quote is that divorce is a communicable disease. Divorce is a communicable disease. Now, here's what he means when he says that. He says, when you find someone who's getting a divorce, if you will look at their friends, they're going to have friends that are encouraging them. The people that you hang around, they have an effect on you. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits, good morals. It was a lesson Samson really, really needed to learn, as we'll see later. King David, the Bible tells us it was the spring of the year. It was the time that kings go out to war. He sent Joab, he sent all the army out to war, but he stayed home. And listen to this. It says, one late afternoon, David got up from taking a nap. Get that? One late afternoon, he gets up from taking a nap. How many of you know I idleness is the devil's workshop? And he's supposed to be at war. He's supposed to be with the army, but he stayed home and he gets up from a nap and he's strolling on the roof of the palace. And from his vantage point on the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was stunningly beautiful. He ends up, you know the story, finding out that her name is Bathsheba and he ends up committing adultery with her. Now, to a certain degree, David set himself up by being in the wrong place. He was supposed to be off to war, but he wasn't off to war. He was in the wrong place. Now, let's continue. When you, let, let me say this. When you're supposed to be in church, when you're supposed to be worshiping and fellowshipping and serving, and you're, you're doing something else, you're in the wrong place. Now, the devil tries to make sin sweet. He tries to make what will kill you sweet. Listen to Judges 14, right? He went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after some time, he returned to get her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. And he took some of it in his hand, and he went along eating. And when he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they also ate, but he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Now, here we find him. He goes to a dead body, by the way, which a Nazarite is not supposed to touch or be around. And he takes something sweet out of something that's dead. Now, that is really what the devil tries to do. He tells you that there's something sweet in something that brings death. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. How I many you know that's a lie? But if you eat of that tree, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, they were, he said, you're going to become like God. The truth was they were already like God. But what he tried to do was make something that would kill them seem to be sweet. Proverbs 5 
For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her steps lay hold of hell. Now, in the beginning, it's smooth. What does it say? Her mouth is smoother than oil. The immoral woman, she drips honey. It seems sweet, but in the end, it goes down to death, and her steps lay hold of hell. Proverbs 20. Bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth will be filled with gravel. The devil always promises what he cannot deliver. He promises ecstasy, pleasure, fulfillment, and freedom, but he ends up delivering guilt, regret, bondage, and ultimately death. The Bible says, but in the end, afterwards, his mouth will be filled with gravel. Now, Samson, I preached a sermon a number of years ago called Samson the Lone Ranger. Right? Here's the interesting thing about Samson. Every single time that you find Samson, he's alone. He is always alone. He never has somebody with him. In fact, he goes down to get married. And the Bible says, and it happened when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. He's going to get married, and he did not have one friend, not one, who could stand up with him and be his best man. So the Philistines had to go and find 30 men to hang around with him because he did not have one single friend. How many know if you don't have any friends, it's not good. In fact, if you don't have any friends, you are in trouble. You're in trouble. See, God did not call you to live alone. When Jesus delivers the Gadarene demoniac, he says, go back to your family and your friends and tell them what great things God has done for you. God created you to live in relationship. The very first thing that happens when a person becomes a Christian, the Bible says that you're baptized or immersed into the body of Christ, the church. God takes you and puts you into the church. In other words, when you're saved, you become part of a kingdom. You become part of the body of Christ. You become part of the family of God. Jesus taught us to pray and say, Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. Not my Father. He is your Father. But Jesus wants you to get the picture that salvation is not just about you and God. And you see, in Western culture, we have personalized and privatized salvation in a way that the Bible never does. Christianity is a relationship between you, God, and the body of Christ, the church. That's what it's supposed to be. Not to be lived alone. It's not supposed to be, well, you know, Jesus, I love you, but I hate the church. All those people that are your family, I hate them. You know how well that's going to go over with God? About as well if you said to me, boy, Pastor, I really love you, but Jeannie, oh, she stinks. We are not going anywhere together. You understand? That, that, is, that is literally what it is like. All right? Uh, if it's not you, God, and the church, it is not the Christianity that the Bible shows us. Jesus sent his disciples out always two by two. You need godly friends. And by the way, if you are the most spiritual person you know, you are in trouble. Right? <laughs> you need somebody who can tell you when you're messing up. Right? Now, let me just say this. Nobody is accountable who doesn't want to be accountable. Nobody's accountable who doesn't want to be accountable. I have what I, I considered for 20 years to be a friend, all right? And, and I could not tell you how many times I said to him, how are things going at home? Oh, things are great. You know, how are you treating your wife? Oh, she's wonderful and our marriage is great. Da, 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 da. He told me that until one week before she left and divorced him. And come to find out they hadn't been living as man and wife for 10 years. See, if you don't want to be accountable, 
you're not going to be accountable. But if there is nobody who can ask you the hard questions, and if there is nobody who can tell you, you need to forgive that person. You need to treat your wife better than that. See, if there's nobody who can speak into your life, who can say, you need to apologize. What you're doing is wrong. You know, I'm going to pray with you. If you don't have anybody like that, see, you, you are not living the Christian life the way the Christian life is meant to be lived. And Samson didn't have anybody that could speak in his life that he would listen to. Nobody. And because of it, he missed his destiny. A life that could have been so much more effective was not effective. Listen to Genesis 13. Now, God had said to Abraham, Abraham, leave your country, leave your family, go to this place that I'm going to show you. And Abraham obeyed God in part. But he took his nephew, Lot, with him. And Lot is like a thorn in Abraham's side. He's not supposed to be there. But finally, this is what the Bible says. And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him. The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him. You know, I've had people say, well, God just isn't speaking to me. Normally, what that means is you are not doing the last thing God said. And God's like, well, I want a word from God and God's doing, well, you haven't done the last one I gave you. And you want another one? Now, God has said to Abraham, leave your country and your relatives. Well, he left his country, but he kept his relatives. God said to him after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes now and look to the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Now, all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. Now, Abraham got a fresh word from God. Once he had separated from Lot. Once there was that separation. And we can have people and things in our life that are keeping us from a fresh word from God. Sometimes there's people in your life you need to separate yourself from. And they're the Jonas. They're the ones that are causing all sorts of turmoil and havoc in your life. And you're trying to help them, but they're not trying to do anything. They'll take anything you want to give them, but they're not about to change. They're not about to put forth the effort themselves. Now, look what God said. He said, look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. All the land you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. Now, Abraham's descendants today, we call them the Jews, the people of Israel. God has said, I'm giving you that land. I'm giving it to you forever. Let me just say that Israel is the only nation on the face of the earth that has their property by a divine grant. God gave Israel a divine land grant. And because he made it, he has permission to give it. I should say he has the right to give it. And we can look today and we can see God fulfilling his promise to Abraham. It says in Ezekiel 38, it says, after many days you will be visited in the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many, many peoples on the mountains of Israel, which have long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. God says that in the last days, he would bring the Jewish people back to their own land. He says, in the latter years. He says, they'll be brought back from all the nations. They'll be brought back from the sword. You know what happened in World War II with the Holocaust? God said, that is a sign that these are the last days. I believe that this is the terminal generation. That this is the last generation. That God is keeping his covenant and his promises. I like what it says in the book of Joshua. It says that not one of all of God's good promises have failed to come to pass. Samson could have had such a great impact with his life, but he missed. He missed what God really had for him. 
The most important thing that God has for us is a personal relationship with Him through Jesus. And I don't know where you are with God today. You may be away from God. It may be you've never lived for God. It may be that there is someone or something that's coming in between you and God right now, like a wedge, and, and you're drifting away from God. If you're away from God, if you don't know God, you say, I want to be right with God or I want to come back to God, I want to invite you to pray this prayer right now from your heart. Just say, oh God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe that his blood paid for my sins. I believe he rose again and I believe he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I'm going to live for Jesus every day. I thank you. You've heard my prayer, that I'm forgiven, that I'm your child, a part of your eternal kingdom. Now, if you prayed that simple prayer from your heart, God heard that prayer, and you are forgiven and right with God. I'd like you to contact us, and this is why. I wrote a book full of bullet points to show you how to keep on growing spiritually. What is your next step spiritually? I want to send you this book free of charge. It'll bless you. And again, it is just full of bullet points to keep you growing in God. All you need to do is contact us. All the information is right there on your screen. At Walking by Faith, we have prayer partners standing by just waiting to pray with you. So if you just prayed with Pastor Dwayne, don't waste a moment. Please give us a call. I know many of you that watch this program have been waiting for a good time to sow a financial seed into this ministry. Right now is the time. Right now, your gift will make twice the difference. An anonymous donor has offered to match dollar for dollar every gift that you give to Walking by Faith up to $100,000 between now and December the 31st. This means that if you send a gift of $25 today, really it doubles and it becomes 50. Or if you send 500, it doubles and becomes 1,000. Whatever you're able to give, we will use to take the gospel to 170 nations around the world, winning souls and transforming lives. Won't you take a moment right now and pick up your phone and call or get online? All the information that you need is right there on your screen. Remember, your gift will make twice the difference, touching lives through walking by faith all around the world. Thank you, and God bless you. If you would like to purchase today's teaching, we have it available on DVD for $8 and CD for $6. Christianity is a relationship between you, God, and the body of Christ, the church. That's what it's supposed to be. To order, just call or visit walkingbyfaith.tv. Thank you for watching Walking by Faith. Walking by Faith is made possible in part by the generous gifts of our viewers. If you would like to contribute to reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ through this program, please contact us at Walking by Faith, 5120 Ivan Rest Avenue Southwest, Granville, Michigan. 49418.